one of the things I think how people can affect these type of changes in their communities. I think it, it's really just voicing your concern. I, last year, we partnered with a group, a youth group that was aged seven through 12 year olds that really grassroots social activism. They went went around, talked to local businesses, asked them how they would feel about banning straws. They wrote letters to the city council. They made signs and created a rally and went down to Sea Hall, sang songs and did a real grassroots level. And then they showed up and a number of the 10 to 12 year olds showed up to the city hall meeting and to really voice that they cared about protecting the ocean. And I think what it says is that this is not something that you have to be a politician. You don't have to be you know, overly wealthy or anything. This is something that seven and 12 year olds can do by just writing letters, by voicing their concern and working with their city halls and city councils. Welcome to Think Bigger, Think Better, where we explore how you can apply insights from visionary leaders and the most provocative philosophers and scientists of our time to make your life and our world a better place. Here's your host, author and speaker, Paul Gibbons. Hey, welcome back to Think Bigger, Think Better. I'm your host, Paul Gibbons. Those of you old enough to remember the movie The Graduate will remember McGuire's advice to Benjamin Braddock. He says... I want to say just one word to you. Just one word. Are you listening? Plastics. Kind of funny at the time, and here we are 50 years after that movie, and plastics are now all over the news, but not as an investment or career opportunity, but as one of our most pressing environmental problems. My guest is Julie Anderson, an executive director of Plastic Oceans International. We have had a fascinating discussion, and I'm sure if you have any concern at all for the environment, it'll be extremely illuminating and I'm afraid to say probably also worrying. Before all that, I picked up blogging again uh, with the help of my friend Daniel Blum. I'm releasing blogs now many times a week rather than many times a year. One of the blog features, sub-features called Ethics in the News, where I review some ethical event that's happened in the business world. And sometimes I pre-release excerpts from my books. I have one coming up called The Science of Change, Leadership, and Management. And that should be out, God willing, inshallah, on March 31st. Uh, I'm about to start a video feature called Debunk of the Week. And I think I'm first going to tackle something like cultural Marxism, if that's of any interest to you. Sometimes the blogs are short firms. I have a list of quotes from women philosophers and leaders to mark the anniversary of Me Too. And I have a list of quotes from African-American philosophers coming out for MLK's birthday. I uh, will have a list of quotes from Chinese business leaders like Jack Ma coming out so anyway, I, I, I want them to be very, I want them to be interested. They're really, really punchy. If that sounds interesting, you head over to paulgibbons.net and get on my mailing list. And I'll also be sending free stuff from time to time. And before I get on with the show, I'd like to thank my three newest Patreon subscribers, Karen Deal, David Bennett, and Rhonda St. Croix, or St. Croix, I'm not sure how we pronounce that in the United States. I'm very, very grateful to you. Thank you. If you have any requests, suggestions, comments, guests, please drop me a personal email, paul at paulgivens.net. Thank you very much. And on with the show. I ran some math the other day at my local Kroger grocery store in Colorado. Nearly 100% of customers use plastic bags, maybe 5 to 10 per customer on average. Let's say they get 200 customers an hour. They were open 20 hours. That's 40,000 a day or 12 million a year, if my math is approximately right. That seems to me an insane number. Uh, just one store in a nationwide chain, of course, there are four in my little town. And that doesn't include the fact that a lot of stuff in the plastic bags has some kind of plastic around it also. My fridge, for example, has 40 to 50 plastic containers. And so is everywhere. And nobody thinks that we are going to turn back the clock to the 1930s and 40s before plastic. I think nylon might have been the 40s. Uh, maybe a little earlier. Uh, no one wants to turn back the clock on that, but we need to be conscious as a world about how much of the stuff is necessary and how much is just sort of laziness, if you will. Here's the thing about plastic. It never degrades. So in fact, it doesn't degrade because the stuff that it's made of is in fact toxic. 
As my guest explains, uh, plastic is made up of polymers, made up of monomers, and the monomers are toxic. The polymers aren't. Of course, some of the polymers leak, and they leak into foods, and they leak into the biosphere. And so that's something we need to be concerned about. So in theory, uh, someone in the year 2219 might stumble across that plastic bottle that you used, and it will be quite likely look similar to the way it looks today. Plastic sits there in the ocean with salt, sun, and UV wave action. It gets turned into microplastics. Those microplastics can be very small. They can be the size of bacteria, and they can find their way into the food chain. And so if you're feeding your kids fish fingers, as I did when my kids were little, there could be microplastics in there. We don't really know what those do to organisms. Uh, You can surmise that they're probably not harmless. So we ought to do something about that. Well, what? Uh, Plastic Oceans is an advocacy and education organization. Their mission is to change the world's attitude toward plastic within a generation. It serves the ocean and the public by engaging people of all ages and all social situations to understand the danger of continuing to perceive plastic as disposable because here's the thing, given what I've just said about its degradability, it isn't really disposable. You may be able to dispose of it, but it's you know off your radar, if you will, but it's not disposable when it comes to the biosphere and earth. So Julie Anderson, my guest, has worked in public health and nonprofit management for 15 years in the United States, Japan, Hong Kong, and Thailand. Julie's career is focused on the effective communication of information regarding new means of improving, safeguarding human health, as well as the environment against the negative effects of industrial development. She's got a BSc in biochemistry and cell biology. (laughs) So do I. (laughs) And her master's is in public health. So let's welcome Julie to Think Bigger, Think Better. Good to talk to you. So I I always start with something really embarrassing for guests, which is, you know, tell us something a little quirky or unusual or strange about you. Let people get to know inside your, in your life a little bit. Well, right now, what's a little unusual is I'm calling from a special place. I've been relocated down to Santa Monica. I'm originally based in Malibu. But the recent fires, I've I lost my home in the fire, and then had to be relocated. And now the torrential rains and mudslides have relocated me down to Santa Monica. So I'm calling from a temporary location basement. So it's wow. great to be here and be able to talk about the impact of the environment and what's going on. It is great, and it's something that, in theory, maybe was caused by an environmental issue. Perhaps it was the the fires are getting stronger and longer and more damaging because of climate change. Uh, I think that's a theory. But also, you, I think um, when we talked earlier, you said something about you worried about the things that burnt in the flyer, all of that going into the air and into the seas, all of the, all of the building materials and everything like that. Is that, is that? Absolutely. There has been extreme questioning and of the air quality because of the fires and all of the components that are in our there are hundreds of homes that were burnt. And you think of all the materials in there from air conditioning units, the PVC piping, the different electrical components, and all of this burnt down, disintegrated. So where these chemicals are being emitted into the air and those that are not being emitted into the air, they are absorbing into the soil and this recent rainstorms are washing them directly into the ocean. So it's extremely tragic to see all this runoff and this pollution runoff right into the ocean. So and what, given my circumstances, it's been made me even more passionate about really we have to do something of how we manage our waste, um, what is happening with our environment as environmental changes become more and more frequent. And that's your your mission is uh, public understanding of science is helping to communicate to the public some of the threats we face. Is that is that in it? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. We're specifically I'm with Plastic Oceans and we our big mission is to stop plastic pollution in particular. But it really is through education and advocacy initiatives that we want to change how we use plastic and better promote plastic management. And I think this is something that could be applicable to other waste materials. You know, I live in Colorado and, uh, you know, northern Colorado, near Boulder, a place called Fort Collins. And I'll tell you that um, uh, you don't expect it to be quite an environmentally sensitive state. It's it's in some ways the state's very progressive. But uh, in my local supermarket, people leave with 20 or 30 plastic bags full of stuff in my local supermarket, hundreds of them an hour. You know, and I sort of did a back of an, an envelope calculation that there were probably – 
I thought probably I didn't have too much trouble getting to a trillion bags, <laughs> which is an extraordinary what? number. I thought. Absolutely. I mean, if you think about not just the bags that you carry your groceries away in, but there are all of the the vegetable plastic bags that people use. I mean, so you easily on a daily level, you're going on a daily use. We're going through millions and millions of plastic bags per day that are used for seconds and thrown away. Yeah, it's insane. I lost my shit with somebody once. I went to a drugstore when I was visiting Las Vegas with one of my young friends, and he bought a tube of toothpaste, and they asked him if he wanted a plastic bag, and he took a plastic bag for a tube of toothpaste. Just one tube. <laughs> for one tube of toothpaste. <laughs> and he didn't get it as well. He didn't get he didn't when I when I lost my shit, he, he didn't know why I, that was so upsetting for me. But anyway. Um But it is so, such a social practice, I think. Yeah. And that is the social norm. I mean, I don't blame people. I think that's where education is so important to make people aware of it so that they can make some changes. I mean, to your story, I lived in Japan for a year and a half. I was living in Tokyo and it's most ridiculous things. You'll see one single apple wrapped in plastic, wrapped in styrofoam, put into a box, then wrapped one more time. And then they will take that package and put it into another bag. So you have like five layers of packaging. It's incredible. It's insane. So let's, uh, <laughs> let's I, I, heard, I was listening to your uh, great film, A Plastic Ocean which I'm going to recommend. I'm going to put a link in the show notes to it. It's on Netflix, so it's free. It's a marvelous, marvelous film. And one of the things that I think Craig Leeson, who founded Plastic Oceans International, I think he's the founder, right? Definitely. Between me and him, we definitely founded this here in the U.S. Oh, you're co-founders of it. Okay, great, 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 great. And he said, the great thing about plastics is it's durable. And the worst thing about plastic is it's durable. So tell us why plastic particularly What's the problem with plastic? This may be a, this may be another half an hour talk of yours. But <laughs> exactly. What's, what's the problem? Well, what's the problem first, with plastic? I think I think we can all say when we think about our daily lives, we can say plastic is a material that has been an incredible invention because, and as you mentioned, plastic is great because it's versatile, it's lightweight, it's durable. It has made drastic improvements in our modern life, making things very accessible for us. It has improved public health in the sense that it, it sanitation purposes for medical instruments, uh, for gloves, plastic gloves, so for hygiene purposes, and even for food sterilization and also food packaging and being able to ship it for longer periods of time. So it's yeah. been incredible in really improving our lives significantly. And historically, you know, there was in the late 1800s, early 1900s, there were plastics around, but they they were biodegradable plastics or natural plastics that used soy, corn, or hemp-based materials. Mm -hmm. um, so that would allow when the plastics broke down, they would return to the earth. It wasn't until probably the 40s, 50s that there was this explosion of mass production of plastics. And that was because there was this economically economical, efficient production of synthetic plastics. And it's the synthetic plastics that are inherently hazardous by design. And even though they've made it a lot easier for us to continue to grow and make these plastics, grow the industry of plastics, so much so um, in the 1990s, you know, we made 100 million tons of plastic in 1990. And now today we're making over 400 million tons of plastic. And that just huge growth. And it's that constant growth, the global market that's producing that much synthetic plastic is inherently the, the problem with plastic. And I can go into more of why synthetic plastics are a problem. Well, I understand that it doesn't biodegrade. I mean, uh, I heard something like 80 to 100 years for some kinds of plastics to degrade in the environment. Uh, for some kinds of plastics, it might be longer. I mean, what's is that one of the problems? That's one of the problems. But really, the negative impact of synthetic plastics is really how they are made. And plastics are made of these long chains called polymers. Mm -hmm. And those long chains are made up of these building blocks called monomers. And a monomer that many people may recognize is BPA or bisphenol A. It was heavily in the news and you'll find pr products on the shelf it's called toxic. BPA free. It's super, exactly. It's toxic. Yeah. Super it's toxic yeah. and shown to cause neurological development issues and in animal studies. And so that that's the reason why they pulled it. And it really to understand why those monomers, I mean, there's also other additives to plastic um, that are added to really give plastic products their unique properties. 
So like the soft pliable qualities of a plastic bag or the firmer quality of a water bottle Mm -hmm. or even the thickness of a shampoo, these additives are really added to give them those properties. And an additive that people also recognize maybe is phthalates. So you'll see a lot of products now that are phthalate free. And as you said, also 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 very, exactly. Also very toxic. And when the concern when they are in plastic products is that these monomers or building blocks and additives, they're added to make it soft and squishy. And because they're pliable is exactly why they have weaker bonds. And that's so they release. So we release some of the monomers. Exactly. Um, so let me just before we go into that, let me just ask you the plastic production process where they're handling lots and lots of toxic chemicals as well. Is that buttoned up? Is that something, or should we be concerned about that too? That's also not airtight, as you suggest. It's those are all the BPAs and then different additives and other additives and monomers are also being leached in the process of making the plastic. So that's not even once it gets into the water bottle where it can leach into our water. So it's in my home. I probably have in my refrigerator, I probably have 40, maybe 60 different kinds of plastics uh, containers in my refrigerator and my freezer. You know, I I think probably a a trip to the supermarket. If I spend $300 at the supermarket, I might have 100 different items, all of which are wrapped in plastic. So which of these are dangerous? Should be Which of these plastics should, you know, as a consumer who wants, who might be worried about their children or neurodevelopmental damage or something like that? Like, what should we be avoiding as consumers? This is just like plastic in the home. Well, we haven't even talked about plastic in the oceans yet. But Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Or I plastic in land. Yeah. So these bonds that break over time, that leach. So these chemicals really, they leach because of extreme temperatures is a problem. So whether it's really hot or cold. And so you definitely do not want to have any plastic item that you are baking in or microwaving where you're going to further weaken those bonds where you're going to increase any type of leaching of those chemicals. I highly recommend never, ever use styrofoam. So like a polystyrene because of all the plastics, those are the plastics that leach the most. Oh, I see. Um, Joe, it's funny, my eight-year-old came home last night, and uh, apropos of nothing, you know, just, you know, popped out of his mouth. Oh, I think, yeah, no, he, we got a, a berry blends, we got a smoothie, and it was a styrofoam thing, and he said, Daddy, we, we shouldn't get styrofoam anymore, because styrofoam kills whales. They cut open a whale, and they found that he had, like, styrofoam, and that's what killed him. And uh, I, I, I say that to make you feel good. Like, some of... <laughs> That's some, some of my little eight-year-old, a third grader, popped home and he told me that just, you know, just like like that. So I do great. Anyway, so I, sorry I interrupted you. But no, I no, I think that's fantastic. And I think that leads into exactly the work that we do is that we really target younger, the younger generation, young students, because we need to break this habit. We need to break this incorrect social norm of believing that all plastics are disposable or harmless. And it's great to see kids more and more kids recognizing this and then spreading that knowledge to their parents. If you will permit me a 10 second commercial break, Think Bigger, Think Better only survives through the kindness and support of patrons. I refuse to sell ads. If you're enjoying it, why not hit that become a patron button on Patreon or on my website, paulgibbons.net slash subscribe. And now back to our show. So no styrofoam and don't put plastic in the microwave. That is something that I I don't do. So don't put plastic in the microwave. And are there any kinds of specific kinds of containers? You know, I mean, it's not easy. You know, plastic isn't labeled, right? So I mean, I don't know how many different kinds of plastic were in the 40 to 60 items that are in my refrigerator right now, but none of them, none of them are labeled, you know? Um, Exactly. so, So I don't really know, you know, what's in there. And I don't know which are durable or not likely to quote unquote leak or which aren't. So... I don't know. Is there anything a consumer can do to, yeah, I mean. And it isn't found within those properties because there are, if you look on the bottom of any plastic bottle, there is a number from one to seven, but it doesn't tell you what monomers or additives that are in there that could leach out. So that is something that still needs to be worked on on a government level or a policy level on how to manage that. But as a consumer, I'd say that it is really avoiding plastics that are going from extreme temperatures. So avoiding the microwave, avoiding styrofoam and for things that like water bottles or even any food, preventing it from sitting in the sun. Like sometimes in my car, I have a glass bottle, but it'll have less leaching if it's in a glass bottle versus a plastic water bottle that's sitting in your car under high heat. Oh, wow. That is interesting. I mean, I don't use plastic water bottles at all. Yeah. 
that's probably the first step. Just if you can't avoid single use plastic, like All plastic right. bags, plastic water bottles, that would be the best. Let's, so let's hear about single use. Single use mean it's not capable of being recycled. So it only once once it's been used, the only place that that can go is a landfill, and then up subsequently the ocean. Is that is that what single use means, or no? So single use is that in its design, it's designed to be used once and then thrown away, and. It might, or, bottle, might not be recycled. It might, or, it might not be recycled. It might not. And it, the likelihood of it being recycled is very low, but it doesn't, single use doesn't necessarily mean that it's not recyclable. It means that it just is going to be used once. So your plastic bag from the grocery store or your plastic bag that you put your fruit in or, or even the wrapper of your candy bar. These are items that you open, you eat your item, you throw it away. So there, there's a very, there's a plan designed for just single use and then throw it away. And whereas if you buy a reusable water bottle, its design and its function is to be used multiple times or a cloth bag is to be used multiple times. So almost everything you buy in the supermarket is single use plastic, isn't it? I mean, the stuff exactly. to store your meat in, a plastic jug for your milk, I mean, whatever, it's all, it's all single use, right? It's almost all single use. And, and that's really contributing to the, the big problem here. There's the accumulation of plastic waste and its hazardous chemicals all over because we are inherently we are designing products to be used once and then we throw it away and we're not considering the life cycle there is at the end of its life where does it go it goes into landfill and sits there and even in best case scenario if it didn't leach chemicals do we have the capability to let trash sit there for hundreds of years and when we are adding to that landfill at an exponential rate, hundreds of years. So the de some of it degrades in hundreds and hundreds of years. It's that stable. The way that a lot of people are seeing this will go into how plastics really break down. They never fully break down into a natural component. And they don't again. break down into anything natural. They might break down into the monomers or the or <laughs> exactly. So they just so they break down into something, something toxic. So it's no, it's no. Even if you're even if you had packs plastics that degraded into their degraded, which they don't, uh, which is another problem. But even if they did, that's another. You know, we, there's no there's no avoiding the problem. <laughs> uh, exactly. I and mean, one, I think it's a probably a a misnomer to to say it breaks down because really it's breaking up. So your your one plastic bottle is going to break up into millions of little pieces and it's just going to keep proliferating as it breaks up and leaching those same chemicals and additives that are found within it. And we call those microplastics. Exactly. So as those break up into smaller and smaller pieces, those become the microplastics that... So, I mean, it'll, it'll be... Right. It'll vary from state to state and country to country, but what percentage of single-use plastics get find their way into recycling? Less than ten percent globally are, are plastic waste are recycled. That's insane. It's unbelievable. <laughs> really. That's really that's a really, that's a really so. There's an opportunity there for sure. Wow. Absolutely. There's. A, I, the, I mean, that's a crazy low number. We should be able to do something about that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, and that really comes down to how people, as a consumer, as individuals, really it's getting natural products or by buying products that are made of recycled material. Now that's a huge ask. Now that that's a big, <laughs> that's a I mean throwing your plastic bottle in the recycling rather than the trash or on the sidewalk or in the ocean that seems to me a behavior that we might be able to change but actually it's changing the way industry thinks about packaging that'll require, you know, I mean, you know, maybe it does. I mean, Whole Foods you, can, you can't get a plastic bag in Whole Foods. I mean, you know, they bag their fruit in paper bags and they bag your groceries in paper bags. So, I mean, there are, there's maybe there's hope. I think, and there's, as more people become aware of things, there are changes here in Los Angeles. So you have Santa Monica, Malibu have given up plastic straws, plastic utensils are now being replaced everywhere in all the restaurants, all the grocery stores. And it does require a certain shift, but people are embracing it. And it does elevate the awareness of how bad plastic is. There is, people are questioning, oh, plastic is bad. And it is getting that message into our habits and into our thought process is what really we're aiming to do so that people start curbing their plastic use. So it's not necessarily safe in the in production. It's not necessarily safe in the home, although some is safer than others. And if you avoid styrofoam and if you don't heat it, you might be okay. But the trouble, or at least the, seems to me the biggest trouble is what happens once we, once we try to get rid of it because we can't. 
and then it degrades into microplastics. So let's hear a little bit about microplastics. It's a word I've heard kicked around. So it never degrades into the monomers. The polymers don't degrade into the monomers, but what they do is they bust up, like if you want structurally or something like that, into little... How, how big is a, a, a microplastic fiber? How small do they get? Can Some you see them? Get, are they, are they, uh, they are micro... Some of them are small microscopic level. So wow. they really compete with microorganisms in, in size of microorganisms in the ocean. And that's crazy. Wow. And that's and that right there is what I tell people when you if you can imagine microorganisms are so critical to sustaining the food chain and life within the ocean. And now if you have an item like a microplastic that's competing in size, how do you differentiate the two? How do you filter out a microplastic from a microorganism? Well, you have to keep the microorganisms in the ocean but you want to take out the microplastics and you just can't, you can't filter out the whole ocean and without really making the good stuff also suffer. Yeah. Interesting. Yes. So the, at the bottom of the food chain, I don't know who, who eats microorganisms, coral or, or krill or. Absolutely. The- so yeah. krill, coral, they're, they're eating these small microplastics and it, from the krill level. So you have krill eating the microplastics and then, bigger fish eating them, the shrimp eating them, you'll, you'll have even bigger, bigger fish going up the food chain up until you get to whales and humans. And the real problem with microplastics is that they're already toxic as it is, but they also have this affinity for other chemicals. So if there's chemical uh-huh. spills, chemical runoff that's already in the ocean, other chemicals leach or latch on to these microplastics like a sponge or a magnet. Oh, so there'll be concentrations of them that are adhered to the microplastic. Exactly. And so So. what happens is then you have animals eat these microplastics and the chemicals will migrate into the fatty tissues of other organisms. So if I if I feed my kids fish fingers tonight, there's not non-zero chance that they'll have some microplastics in them and and that situation is only getting worse. Exactly. So yeah, they won't, it'll have the chemicals from the microplastics. And if they are eating, and depending on how much they eat, I know sometimes people will eat the entire sardine or the entire anchovy. And then we're eating the digestive system where there's tons of it. Exactly. Ooh, that's, this is, this is horrible. It's not good. It's not good to end, but I think we share this information to curb our habits, to um, change our habits, change the way the system is working now. And we really push how bad it is so that we can change it faster. And there are definitely ways that we can do that by just being aware. So one of the problems with oil, with petrochemicals, is that not only is the world population increasing the way populations do, but also the you know petroleum product consumption per capita is going up as people are industrialized countries. They want their cars <laughs> and they want their, you know, they want their homes and their air conditioning. So it's not only the numbers are increasing, but the per person use on the planet is increasing. Is that the case with plastic too? Not only is the population of the world growing, but the per capita plastic use is still growing. I guess it is as countries Absolutely. industrialize. Worldwide, they, they are, the consumption of plastic is increasing. And as you point out, even oil is used to make plastic items. And 14% of global oil consumption is used to make plastic products. So you're doubling up the carbon footprint by just using single, single you said, you said four, 14 or 40? 14. 14. Yeah, 14. Mm. Right. So let's just spend a little more time with the, the problem now. So what about plastic that finds its way into landfills? I mean, is that where most of it finds its way? Um, you know, the stuff um, throwing our trash or where's it? Exactly. Usually? Yeah. Uh, the majority of plastic does make it into landfill along with all of our waste. And fundamentally, they're our waste, how we see waste management or, or the end of life of all of our waste, it's linear. So we buy something, we consume it, and we throw it away, and it goes to landfill. Very straight. We buy it, we dig out new resources, make the product, buy it, and then it just makes it, use it, make it, put it into the landfill. Really, what we need to do is start thinking of waste management as a circular economy here. Yeah. And what it is is where we're we pull the resources from the earth, we make our product, we buy it, we recycle it. We don't see it as waste, but we see it as a valuable resource. Then we recycle it properly to make that product again. And so it stays within a circular loop of waste management rather than just constantly filling up this landfill. 
Well, listeners may have heard that time before, and I mean, you've sort of explained it now. So a cir- circular economy is that we extract resources from the planet, and then we use them for whatever you use them, whether it's a container or whether we eat it or something like that. And then we have it so that they, the, dis- the parts that we dispose of, the parts we don't use, are waste is a usable substrate in some way or another can be changed into something that we can reuse again. Exactly. And that's so that it's, we're not constantly extracting new resources from the earth over and over again. And ultimately, I mean, that is what then makes it sustainable. That's the circular vision of not ever seeing it as waste that will just go in and pollute, but yet it's considered a resource that can be broken down, recycled, and right. made back into that original product. So the lack of a circular economy both exacerbates the resource depletion of the planet, and we haven't even begun to, you know, <laughs> begun to feel that pain yet. But also at the other end of it, it's the disposal, and we've been talking mostly about the disposal of it. Exactly, and really, when it gets, it's that poor waste management at the end end of life. So the disposal of that product that you're using. It's that poor waste management process that is really causing it to get it back into the environment and harm it. So back into the oceans, back into the soil or air um, in a negative way, harmful way. I've never seen a a garbage dump landfill, I don't think, except in the movie. um, What was that Indian movie? Bombay. Was it Bombay something or other? The kid was in a big. Yes. um, What was it called? Millionaire. Listeners, feel free to feel free to leave the name of the movie in the comments. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, wh- where are these down these landfills? Uh, if you know, look around. I've never I've never seen one. I mean, uh, I, I live in a, a leafy suburb. You know, where are we putting the all U- this stuff? <laughs> <laughs> well, the U.S. tends we're we're very fortunate that we have a lot of land and to hide our waste, to ship it to different places, to be able to ship it to different countries. Our landfills are nicely managed. We do have waste management systems that are good, but they're not perfect. From even our waste, a lot of the waste that we have that makes its way into the environment is usually because of either illegal dumpings or things that spill off the truck or littering or wind carries items from the landfill into the environment or spillovers of trash cans. And that's in very developed countries like the U.S. where we we have that. When you think about our oceans in general, our oceans are, are being affected by everybody. So the world. So there are countries that do not have proper landfills and contained landfills or proper waste management where they're being collected or there are no trash cans at every corner. Um, so these are the places oh, that yes. are really affecting the plastic waste that's really getting into all of our water systems. So if you we were looking at, I'm imagining a pie chart. So 10% gets recycled, and then there's a bunch goes into landfill, and then there's a bunch that doesn't. Or there's a bunch that goes into landfill and then gets blown or somehow or another disrupted from the landfill. So what what are the numbers, roughly speaking, is in the United States? So in I know more globally. So right now we make about globally 350 million tons of plastic a year or a little over 400 million now i think it's last year it was 350 million we're probably over 400 million now and if you think of that as 10 percent of that is 40 million of that is being recycled right. yep. and about 10 million tons of that is actually making its way into the oceans okay so 10 million tons per annum and the oceans are very very big but already i've heard what's this thing i heard about this big big thing in the middle of the Pacific Ocean that's, I don't know, that's, you know, I don't know if it's a mile square or maybe it's several so, miles square. It's a big, big mess of, you know, human yeah, well, excrement of one kind Well, what another. it is, it's, they're called gyres, which are basically the natural currents that are occurring within our oceans. Gyres. G-Y-R-E-S. Yeah. And they're big currents, the largest one being in the Pacific. And what happens is, the currents around the world, they, it pulls in all the trash and waste from different areas. And it gets pulled into this vortex, basically, mm-hmm. in, in this area. And the current, the salt, the, sa- the sun, all of this activity is further breaking down the plastics faster. Yep. So then they're turning into yep. microplastics. And one of the people like to call it the great garbage patch, which gives this impression that it's an island. It looks like it's something that you can go and yeah. lasso and take away. But what's happening is because of that, 
all of this activity, suns, salts, and currents, it's breaking down into microplastics and really creating this soupy mess. So it's about three feet, four feet of microplastics, oily matter, and big and small pieces of plastic that you really can't just easily sieve or clean up. We just can't drive by and scoop it up with the big... No. No. As much as that... There are still big plastics in there that that could definitely benefit from somebody going and picking it up and properly disposing it. But what's worse, as we imagine, it is more of a soupy mess. You, This is getting grosser every minute. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's do two things in our, in our last uh, 20 minutes or so. I want to know what consumers can do. And I also want to hear at some length about what Plastic Oceans is trying to do. Either one first. Okay. <laughs> well, I think we need to change the social norms of accepting. Right now, I believe that the plastic is believed to be disposable. We, it is not disposable in the sense that it will not just go away and disappear. This is something that is breaking up. It's toxifying our soil, our land, our water, and our air. So it's really just cutting back, reducing the amount of plastic each one of us individually can use. And as we teach young kids and adults also, is we really refusing, reusing, and recycling. It's critical on an individual level, reducing the amount of plastic we use, refusing plastic bags, plastic straws, utensils, water bottles, things that are that can be easily replaced with reusable items. So very, Often. very, very, um, if you're very specific, like I, I guess I'm, I would consider myself only light green, I'm afraid, but um, I stop, I won't buy plastic water bottles. I mean, is, are that, is that one of the things a consumer can do is just don't buy, you know, don't buy your, I mean, I, I hardly know a person in this little suburban town that I live in that doesn't buy a, you know, a case of 24 plastic bottles of water to drink in the car or at home. It, it, it's a hard habit to break, but it's, Definitely possible. I think individually, by just choosing to have a reusable bottle and implementing a refill station at your work, at schools, is critical into really just spreading that that message. And I think at every change, as much as it seems like this is a huge problem, every social change starts with one person and really affecting behavioral change with their group. I mean, it only takes one child to educate their parents their parents then stop buying it as much or they stop buying. In your case, you heard your son said we shouldn't buy styrofoam. The likelihood of you buying styrofoam next time is reduced. Mm -hmm. And that is the, that's the wave of change that we're pushing. And it really does start with one person, one community at a time. Got it. What can people do? I mean, how could I, how could I get my, my local grocery store to, cause in some States in the United States or some cities or municipalities or some places, plastic bags are illegal or they tax them. I don't know if they're ever actually banned. Does California ban them? I know, I know one country banned them, didn't it? Was it Chile? Chile. Has banned. In Chile. So we were, we were actually part of that ban and we went down and, and pushed the film as well as we went down to Chile and we have a, office based in Santiago, really pushing and working with the environmental board there, the Ministry of Environment, to push for plastic reduction and phasing out, banning plastics. And it really was... And that's insane. A, so it can be done, right? I mean, you know... And, and it started off small. It is... Chile isn't, Chile isn't crippled. <laughs> it's not, it, it's, the economy's not crippled. And it started right? off yeah. with plastic bans on the coast. And then they said, this is doable. And they spread it countrywide. Great. And any other countries that are, you know, bright spots here? Colombia is planning on doing it as well. We, uh, with a ban there, there are bans in plastic in Kenya. I want to say so, Kenya is one of them. Don't think of the Latin American countries as being environmentally progressive, but here we are. Absolutely. That is if part of Plastic Oceans. We really are pushing for Latin America uh, in terms of because they are progressive and there is the, their economy is growing. So on a, on a GDP level, their economy is growing and therefore we anticipate growth in their plastic use. And so we're really trying to push for education and awareness with plastic use as well as the management of that plastic waste. Well, I mean, amazing work. I mean, really mad props to you guys for, for, for doing that. Um, what about states in the United States or municipalities in the United States? Who's winning the war here for us? Well, there's a number of cities that have been passing bans on plastic, starting off with smaller items like the straws, utensils, bags. Uh, we just passed one here in 
Santa Monica on January 1st. The ban took effect last year. Malibu banned plastic straws and utensils. And one of the things I think, just to touch on your question earlier, how people can affect this, these type of changes in their communities, I think it, it's really just voicing your concern. I, last year, we partnered with a group, a youth group that was aged seven through 12 year olds that really grassroots social activism. They went went around, talked to local businesses, asked them how they would feel about banning straws. They wrote letters to the city council. They made signs and created a rally and went down to Sea Hall, sang songs and did a real grassroots level. And then they showed up and a number of the 10 year 10 to 12 year olds showed up to the city hall meeting and um, to really voice that they cared about protecting the ocean. And I think what it says is that this is not something that you have to be a politician. You don't have to be you know, overly wealthy or anything. This is something that seven and 12 year olds can do by just writing letters, by voicing their concern and working with their city halls and city councils. That's amazing. That's inspiring stuff. So practically I'm sitting here, I'm in Fort Collins, Colorado. Colorado leans, leans progressively. My local grocery stores is a Kroger, which is a nationwide yeah. chain. How do I get these guys? What would be, you know, do I write to the corporate head office? Do I start to, is it at the local, the political level? Do I start to talk to city councilors or what's the drill? I think it's starting even just at your local grocery store with the manager. A lot of times is what can we do to ban these plastic bags? Getting voice, collecting your friends to say, write a petition to the manager saying we don't want these plastic bags and can we replace them with paper bags, getting schools involved, getting your child's class involved in just writing letters to the manager at Kroger's. And what it does is that now you've create a team that is really pushing for this change. And it just starts with, so identifying the manager, getting to your family, friends to sign on to that letter, asking to change their plastic bag policy and really and then pushing it to schools to also support it that yeah wow and that's the way now what about what support do you offer to people who want to become activists at plastic oceans what well, we, of resources do you have for them we encourage um people to watch the film a plastic oceans we do have an educational educational material that you can that can help guide like a workshop to get people on board on what mission you want to do to think about the type of policy you might want to affect in your community at a school level we do have educational programs and we also encourage kids to get involved in fundraising for different types of plastic reduction projects and we also do initiatives where we raise funds to actually implement and install different refill stations into schools so we always look for help for that all of these can be found on our website, plasticoceans.org. And there's loads of material and resources that can be found there that can help an individual change their habits to those that want to get more involved in working with their community. How many are you at uh, Plastic Oceans International? We have a number here in the U.S. We have six of us, but we also have a number of volunteers. Like We have six staff, but we have also an office in Mexico City, we have an office in Colombia, Chile, and in Vancouver. And are you funded by um, philanthropy, by the Ellen T. MacArthur Foundation? Do I see Ellen MacArthur Foundation? We're not fun funded by them. We do have lots of part. We partner with a lot of organizations that have stronger roots in the EU and the UK. Like Ellen MacArthur Foundation is based in the UK, so they have a strong base there. Uh, we are funded primarily through individual donors as well as we have some corporate sponsorship. Individual donors. So so, so one of the ways that um, listeners can support you is there's a way to do that on your website? Is the way to, to get involved Definitely. on the website financially? Can, okay. Absolutely. There we have a donate button <laughs> where you can donate directly to support our overall initiatives, or you can specifically choose initiatives that we're working on, new campaigns that we're working on. Uh, I'm definitely going to do it. I mean, as soon as I hang up this call, probably. But for listeners, they want to go to plasticoceans.org and uh, they can find resources there for how they can become activists in their communities. They'll find resources like research. They'll find a link to the Plastic Oceans film, which is on Netflix. I think it's called A Plastic Ocean is the exact name. Is that right? Correct. Correct. 
and they also will can have an opportunity to to contribute and to really help the amazing work that you're doing around the world. I mean, that's amazing that you've been able to affect change on a national level. You know, maybe there were many people that you know many people at the thing, but I mean, you know, you got that's tremendous that you've managed to persuade a an entire country. Right. We're doing down. I mean, just even to further on that on Chile, the reason we're pushing on Latin America, our next campaign is swim against plastic and we have the national swimmer of, from South Africa attempting to swim, be the first person to swim around Easter Island to really highlight how even the most remote island in the world, Easter Island, is collecting loads and loads of plastic waste from other countries as well as from the tourism left behind. Oh, wow. That's great. So is that so someone who's a, a distant swimmer, that's probably a hell of a distance. So <laughs> uh, who's doing it? It's Sarah Ferguson. She is the national swimmer of South Africa, and she will be the first person then to attempt to swim 80 kilometers around Easter Island. What really makes it difficult isn't just the distance, but it's the strong currents and the frigid cold temperatures. Wow. Yeah. And it's really Look. just to raise awareness of all the plastic pollution that's even affecting islands that seem like they would be immune to it given their distance. I find myself listening to you and becoming more aware and more educated on some of these topics. I find myself thinking, I have to say, kind of powerless, like, oh my God, this is considerably worse than I thought it was. And I'm, I mean, I've been looking for, to do podcasts on plastic since I started this podcast a year ago. So you're the, you're my first victim. And um, <laughs> so, I mean, I've been concerned about it, but I have to say, I leave this call like, like even more concerned, like even well, I w- it's considerably I worse than that, I thought. <laughs> exactly. I, I hope that it's, it's more to raise awareness of the extent of the problem, but I would like to say that there is there are ways to change it. And I think I'd like to use the example of smoking and how 40 years ago, 30, 40 years ago, you would find smoking on every on airplanes, airplanes, and <laughs> hospitals. Yeah. There were um, there was almost yeah. no place that you could go without smoking. And then today, you know, I'm, I have an eight year old as well. And he finds it odd to see somebody smoking. And he even asked once, he's like, why, did, why is there a no smoking sign in the elevator? And because he just thinks, why would you yeah. have to put it there? You don't smoke there anyhow. And so yeah, it is possible one step at a time at one state at a time. It was 1990 when California affected a ban on smoking in public areas. And now we have practically no smoking in this whole country, let alone we almost don't find smoking in many, many countries as well. And I think the same thing can happen one step at a time, one ban at a time. And it's through awareness that we can create this change. Well, that's an inspirational message. You know, when you think about it that way, yes, that's right. 30, 1990, how many years ago? It's 1990, 20, 29 years ago. Exactly. And it's not that long to have global, a real global shift. I I don't know a single person who smokes in my sort of milieu any longer. We all did. We all did. Exactly. 40 years ago. (laughs) That's great. Look, I really want to thank you. I can't thank you. I can't just like amazing work that you're doing around the world and raising awareness in this. I'm glad to be on the team. Glad to be able to help promote the amazing work you're doing. Uh, Certainly going to become a contributor, going to encourage all my listeners to become a contributor, but mostly just thank you for your time today. Thank you so much for raising awareness with everybody in, in your network. And this is very exciting. Thank you so much. And hey there, that was so informative for me. Um, I'm going to keep this outro super, super short. I am writing like crazy right now. I'm doing images from the book and book covers from the book and writing chapters and proofreading chapters and rereading chapters and rewriting chapters. So it's been a hell of a job. It's a very going to be a very exciting book. I think it's going to be groundbreaking. It's going to be called Subtitled, The Behavioral Revolution. And the main title is The Science of Change, Leadership, and Management. If you're a business person, um, when my science of organizational change came out, I'm going to say something very immodest right now. It was one of the first books, 2013, 2014, that talked about behavioral science and businesses. And now we hear talk of businesses hiring chief behavioral officers, like the behavioral sciences, like the new black. The business world, I think it's fair to say, is going gaga for it. And this book is going to be maybe still one of the first books that is a useful summary of what's happening in the behavioral sciences and how business people can put that to use. I'll let you be the judge of that. March 31st, it should be coming out. Get on my list if you want free chapters and free early releases and to know when it comes out. 
Uh, in closing, let me thank my Patreon supporters again. Uh, we're friends and family, but um, people are now coming in outside the friends and family circles. I'm immensely grateful to them. I'm releasing some podcasts privately to only to people who support uh, the podcast. I think I need to do that to encourage people to chip in two bucks, five bucks, 10 bucks a month. But uh, I'm very, very excited. In fact, I've done a podcast on the behavioral sciences and businesses, which I released to only Patreon subscribers a couple of weeks ago. But mainly, thank you for listening and supporting the show. I hope you found Julie Anderson fascinating, as interesting as I did. And I'll talk to you in a couple of weeks. Thank you. To celebrate the launch of the show, and thank you all for listening, I'm going to be giving away books. Lots and lots of books. All you have to do is leave a review in iTunes. We're going to raffle off a book every single week for 12 weeks. So head on over to paulgibbons.net slash iTunes to get easy to follow directions and let me know the title of your review to make sure that you're entered to win. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of Think Bigger, Think Better. Great ideas are great, but this isn't gospel. Share your critical thinking in the comments. Where do I disagree? What insights were most powerful? If you got value, don't forget to share the value by sharing the podcast. Finally, to get information on book and blog releases and new video content, head over to paulgibbons.net and join the community of thinkers talking about using science and philosophy to make our world a better place.